Right now, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is the only other real name in the race with regards to the 2024 presidential rematch between Trump and Biden. Most polls have him sitting at just under 10% of the vote, meaning he doesn't really stand a chance at the Oval Office. But he could certainly sway the vote come November, likely not in Biden's favor. Now, according to a new report by CNN, the director of RFK Jr.'s campaign, Rita Palma, apparently said that Kennedy's race was largely just to get rid of Biden. This all comes from a now deleted YouTube video, which was confirmed in its legitimacy by Palma herself, where she addresses Republicans. In it, she outlines their goal of, quote, eventually hopefully getting rid of Joe Biden out of deep blue states, telling members of the GOP in the video, we're all on the same team right now and we'll be on the same team later, as long as Trump or Kennedy wins. The video includes slides outlining how Kennedy's strategy was to take blue votes away from Biden in an attempt to prevent either candidate from reaching the 270 electoral vote threshold hold, meaning that Congress would have to choose the president in the end, with Palma adding, if it's a Republican Congress, they'll pick Trump, so we're rid of Biden either way. Kennedy's campaign has since responded, saying Palma is a ballot access consultant and is not involved in their electoral strategy. Over the weekend, I was watching this game play out, and there's an interesting common pinata out there the independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The media is increasingly coming at Kennedy because they are increasingly realizing, because of what they're hearing from their buddies in the parties, that Kennedy will probably determine the outcome of this election if he gets on the ballots. I don't know that he can win, but he can certainly affect the outcome. So they are putting him in cleanup mode constantly. And I have him on tonight to do that in part. But I want to talk to him about the bigger dynamic, because you can gotcha all three of these guys all day long. OK, but is that in the best interest of the people? So now it's what he said about January 6th. OK, the quote is, I haven't examined the evidence in detail, but reasonable people, including Trump opponents, tell me there is little evidence of a true insurrection. Now, people got really pissed about that statement because of video scenes like this, okay? He also said that a widely debunked claim that participants in the January 6th riot carried no weapons. A few hours later, he retracted that part of the statement. Good for him. That alone is rare these days, right? You have in Trump, you know, he'd rather fight to the death than admit he was wrong about anything. You've never heard him admit he was wrong, except about that tape with the let him grab you by the honk honk, right? That was the only time we've ever seen it. And he probably regrets that. So why did he issue the statement in the first place? And what does he think about his role in this dynamic, which is gonna be a gotcha-thon all the way through? Joining me now, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Happy to give you the opportunity, Bobby. Good to see you. Good to see you, Chris, and thank you, and I really, I really enjoyed your lead talking about the eclipse and how that brought Americans together. And, um, you know, your observation that there are there are uh, vested interests out there that are trying to keep us apart, to try to keep us at each other's throats, but that we still have a common ground and that we can find it in 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 uh, in instances like today. Uh, that was that was very beautiful. And thank you for uh for sharing that, I, I um, you know, you, you talked about my, uh, what I would say were unforced errors this weekend. We made a couple of, of mistakes. Uh, it started with a email that went out about January 6th from my campaign that did not reflect my views about January 6th. And then it was followed very quickly by a uh, by another, by a press release that had the, uh, the factual error in it. And, you know, all I can say that this is my responsibility, it's my campaign. Uh, we have a lot of hardworking people on the campaign, but we're all drinking from fire hoses. We have to do things that other campaigns don't. We have to get a million and a half signatures. We have to pay for our own secret service. We have to, we have, we have only we are able to to raise only a tiny fraction of the money that the other campaigns they can get a hundred thousand dollars. They can get a million dollars 
per donor. We are only allowed to take $6,600 per donor. So we're trying to make do with less, and we make mistakes. And I made two mistakes this week, and I left people with an imp the impression that I did not uh, share, I think, what is the general consensus about January 6th. That it was a it was a traumatic day in our nation's history. That there were uh, police who were uh, beaten, who were assaulted. That there were congressional members who were threatened. Uh, that there were that there were people who were intending to obstruct the peaceful transfer of power in this country, and that's not okay. And it's not okay. Do you, even believe, if you believe it was an insurrection was stolen? I think it. I think it's. It was a. I think it was a protest that turned into a riot. I think there were people who wanted an insurrection, uh, and but it, I. I don't know what your definition of an insurrection is. If your if your definition is armed men um, who are invade who are intending to take over the United States government, it wasn't that. I think it, there were people there who wanted to obstruct the peaceful transfer of power from one administration to the other. So it was a, I would say it was a very traumatic day in our nation's history and that, you know, people committed criminal acts. Uh, those people deserve to be in jail. Um, right. My, you know, one of the statements that I made that upset people, as I said, and I would appoint a special counsel to, to look at, you know, there was 350 people co convicted of one of a from of a statute that's obstructing the procedure of Congress, and that there's been complaints by people by a large part of the public about whether they were fairly whether their sentences were appropriate. And what I said is I would appoint a special counsel to look at that. My purpose, Chris, is not to exonerate those people, but rather just to restore peace. I think, you know, we're living at a time when Americans don't trust their government anymore. And, um, and that is really what the problem is. There is no trust in government, and we need to restore that trust. So what I'm going to do as president is I'm going to make Americans, people who I don't agree with on issues, but if there's large numbers of people who see the world in one way, even if I see it in a different way, I'm going to listen to them. And I'm going to right. fairly look at their point of view. And, you know, um, the presidents appoint special counsels all the time. They do it even when, you know, to investigate themselves. So that, to assure the public that there is a I'm process here that the public can trust. And we, we need it. to I'm do that now. About... I mean, nobody... No, um, look, I, I get it. I get the misgivings. Um, I'm worried about special counsels. Uh, I believe the Department of Justice uh, should do its job. And I believe that the 9-11 Commission was really the gold star standard of how to do this. I think there should be one on the pandemic. I think there should be one on where and when life begins. I think there should be one on, you know, what the sentence range was on January 6th, if you want. That's fine. But I think that you got to get it away from these special counsels because they don't seem to really bring peace uh, to anybody's mind about situations. You, know, you and I have talked about this, Bobby, and I'll let the audience in on it. They can judge me. What else is new? I find your candidacy to be really intriguing uh, because I think that you have become such an antenna for all of the energy that gets sent out from both sides. Every time one side thinks that Bobby's going to affect us more than the other side, they start coming at you as how toxic you are to the process. And I believe it shows how toxic the process is. You have been in constant cleanup mode for three weeks now, ever since you started getting more media attention in the latest round of polling. And what does that mean to you? Like, look, my advice to you, by the way, would be, man, you better stop clarifying things because people don't do that anymore. They just stick to their guns and let their supporters have their back and just say the other side's worse. They never apologize. They never correct anymore. Uh, I get why you're doing it, because I know you. But what do you think this dynamic says about where we are, that you cannot say anything right? 
Well, you know, when I when, when I announced my campaign, and it's interesting because my dad was in the same position that I was when he ran in 1968. He was running against an incumbent president of his own party. Uh, he didn't have any institutional support from labor unions, from the the liberal press, from the New York Times, the Village Voice was all against him. The uh, the big city mayors were all against him. All the institutions, even the people who he had brought into office eight years earlier with the New Frontier, with his brother, they were all now working for Johnson, so he was really kind of alone, and he ran for a moral reason, which is he wanted he just could not see supporting Johnson on the war, so he thought he had to speak out against the war, and he was going to run, even though he had very, very little chance of winning at that time. But he made his campaign an experiment in telling the truth to people, and he told, you know, he told students at colleges that he was going to end their draft deferments, which they didn't want to hear. He told medical students that they were going to pay for his health care system. He told uh, black Americans in Watts who were revolting that they needed to abide by the law. He told uh, University of Alabama white kids that they needed to be sensitive about the civil rights. And all of these things were things that politicians advised him not to do. And he did them anyway, and he ended up winning the Democratic primaries because of that and driving Johnson out of the race. And I believe he would have been president if he had been, you know, if he hadn't been assassinated. When I announced nine months ago, I said, you know, our whole country has had just had a big medical experiment for three years performed on them. And I'm going to do a mass experiment now myself. And it's an experiment just in telling the truth to people, the truth as I see it, which, you know, I could be wrong about, but if I'm wrong, I'm going to change that. And if there's an appetite in this country for hearing the truth actually from politicians, then, you know, then I'll win. I'll be president next November. I think people are so tired of being lied to. And, you know, when I was a kid, when my uncle was president, it was 80 percent of Americans believed the government. Believe, Americans believed the government would never lie to them. In fact, the first right. time that Americans realized our government lies to us is when Gary Francis Powers was shot down in the U-2. And in 1973, the Pentagon Papers came out and Americans were like, oh, my God, the government actually lies to us. Today, 90% of Americans believe the government lies virtually every day. And if you don't believe that, then you're not paying attention. And one of the problems is, Chris, as you know, the journalists, the press, is no longer doing its job of questioning the president, of maintaining that posture of eternal and fierce skepticism. They've become instead uh, amplifiers for all the lies that the government tells us. And you, you look at this polarization, and it's driven so much because people no longer have faith in any of the institutions of our country, the press, the regulatory agencies, the Congress, the president. They think everybody lies to them. And, you know, I think we if we're going to bring people together and end this toxic polarization, We've got to, we've got to give people, restore people's faith in our government. And I, if I'm in there, I'm going to tell the truth to people, and that's what I'm trying to do now. And it's not always easy because you have to admit when you made a mistake, and I made a mistake this weekend. Well, look, if you're willing to come forward and say, look, uh, I don't know whether it was insurrection. Depends on your thing, but it was a very bad thing, and I didn't mean anything else. That's fine. As long as you stay true to what you believe about things, people have a great detector for it. They may disagree with where you are on something, even after you clarify it. But it is still refreshing to people, because we're in a situation now where, you know, I believe there are a lot of people in the media who are doing the job the right way and how they cover the White House and they're doing it for the right reasons. It's just hard for them to break through, because, you know, if you don't play the game like everybody else, you don't get any love from either side. You don't get love for the administration. You don't get love from who hates the administration if you're not catering to them. But it is the way people expect to live everywhere else in their lives, which is, hey, I made a mistake. I, I shouldn't have done it. I meant this and I said that. That's on me. I won't do it again. It's just not allowed in politics. They bury you, which is why I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about the dynamic. And as I have said, whether people like it or not, as long as you're in the race, you're welcome to make your case to the American people. That's the way the job works. Chris, thank you so much for having me. All right. I'll talk to you again. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr.
Right. All right, so the independent candidate, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is trying to get himself out of the latest controversy surrounding his comments about January 6th. The campaign said in a fundraising message uh, stating that protesters that day had been, quote, stripped of their constitutional liberties was an error. Then, in an email to supporters, they said, quote, I have not examined the evidence in detail, but reasonable people, including Trump opponents, tell me there is little evidence of a true insurrection. They observed that the protesters carried no. no weapons. Now, he later clarified, saying that statement was incorrect. All right, what's going on here, Mark, with RFK Jr.? Oh, well, he's just accustomed to saying whatever comes into his mind, and some of the stuff that comes through his mind is crazy. Like, <laughs> you know, seven months after 9-11, he famously said that pig farmers were more dangerous than Osama bin Laden. This is the guy who's running for president now, and he's got essentially sort of a clown show of a campaign. What do you mean by that? Well, it's composed of various people who don't know what they're doing, including the candidate. And so they have a tendency to just say things and like, oh my God, I didn't mean to say that and retract them. Now that stuff worked for Donald Trump, but you know, Kennedy is not Donald Trump and anyone he's kind of trying to be. Anyone want to push well, back no, on? No, I was just going to say, didn't I feel like we're saying the same thing as what we said in 2020 when, or 2016 when Trump was running and like, there's no way he yeah, can but Trump is still a good... running though, is the thing. But, you, you, that, that, that lane is still Trump's but, lane. But one of the thing, but we didn't know it was Trump's lane in 2016. We just sure. never thought it was going to happen. But one of the questions I have, because I think I'm the only person, this is for Chris, um, that I still think RFK takes Trump voters more than they take Biden voters, because so, I think it's the same it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a super interesting question, and it's sort of the moment that we're in right, right now, and that's why I'm going to play the yeah, video. I, yeah. Okay, so th this video is going around. It is from Rita Palma. She is listed, at least as of last night, as the New York director for Kennedy's presidential campaign. It's making the round on social. Play it. Nobody gets to 270. Then Congress picks the president. So who are they going to pick? Who are they going to pick if it's a Republican Congress? They'll pick Trump. So we're rid of Biden either way. <clears throat> All right, so the campaign's been asked about this. Here's what they told us in a statement. They said, quote, she is not involved in electoral strategy nationally or in New York. This was not a can of campaign event. She was speaking as a private citizen. You see the statement on so the screen. What's they're, going on they're, here? They're saying that because they don't want to alienate Democrats who would come over because it'll make Trump president, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about any of that stuff. What I care about is... <laughs> What is the rationale here? What's the thinking? To your question, what's the, who does this hurt more? And she's making a very convincing argument to, I assume, a Republican-leading audience. Yeah. Actually, this hurts Biden a lot more. And I think a lot of Republicans are going to get more excited about RFK because they're going to say, hey, look, this guy's really going to kill Biden and Trump's going to win New York because basically she was making this Mwah! argument <laughs> that because of RFK <clears throat> that Joe Biden would not win New York by 2 million votes like he did last time. See, I'm using numbers, not percentages. <laughs> uh, by 2 million votes as he did last time, but that Donald Trump will win with a plurality. And I can see a lot of Republicans getting high on the hopium here and that it's all going to happen, it's going to do this stuff. But I would be careful if I was a Republican, because in the battleground states, we don't know where RFK is going to get on the ballot, but in the battleground states, in the it, among the voters who most want to burn the world down okay. and who are most fed up with the establishment of both you're, parties and most I whatever... Totally you're nodding yes, you're nodding if, yes. If, if, I, if I was a Republican, I wouldn't want... RFK Jr. on the ballot in Arizona. I wouldn't want him on the ballot in uh, North Carolina. I wouldn't want him on the ballot in Georgia. Live by the poll, die by the poll. Franklin and Marshall poll in Pennsylvania last week really showed that Joe Biden leading Donald Trump by 10 in a multi-candidate race where RFK Jr. is there, that 10-point lead becomes a two-point lead. Hmm. Another poll by Equis, uh, the uh, Democratic firm in Arizona, swing state, Nevada, swing state, shows that RFK Jr. pulls all so many votes from among Hispanic voters from the electorate that Trump almost beats, if not beats, Joe Biden among that segment of the electorate, and he would win that state. So you're saying that it's well. taken Biden so better. far. It is, but However, correct, so far because if this usually in this point of polling, when you look at these, like Democrats are generally unsatisfied with their nominee because they're always wanting to be bigger and bolder. There's a good chance, a good chunk of people there. This president has a particular un. An, uh, a favorability problem, but when the, election, say, when the election closes in the end, Democrats come home, those numbers solidify, and that small segment, I think, of like okay. this changing GOP base, I think they're looking for a home, they may go the I think home. Republicans should be very careful about what they wish for here. And okay. the, uh, right. the Trump campaign is actually doing stuff about it, and the RNC is doing stuff about it. They are taking it seriously. Democrats are just taking it more seriously, and they're, they're more scared of RFK. All right. Thank you for watching, and make sure you go to joinnn.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.
There's ways of talking about these issues that bring us together, but that's not going to come from President Biden or President Trump. As both of them feed on the polarization. Both of them are saying the, the principal reason you should vote for me is if you vote for the other guy, democracy is going to be over. And that there's no way, if that's what you're telling the public, that you're going to be capable of ending the polarization. <laughs> We're going to do this without an intro, unless you want an intro, but no, I no. feel like uh, you're going to be all right. Cheryl Hines' husband, how about that? Uh, it is the best thing that anybody says about me. <laughs> so we could talk about Curb for an hour, but instead, uh, let's talk about what's going on at the moment, because uh, we're rolling into April here. Things are starting to get serious. There are three guys left, and you're one of them, but you got to figure out how you take some of the Trump people and some of the Biden people. So we just had lunch with about a dozen people kind of discussing a bit of that, but what, what does that pitch look like? What is the, what is the move you have to make and how is it different taking some of the Trump people and taking some of the Biden people? Yeah. Well, you know, we, I, our, I, I wish I could, I wish we had recorded our conversation. Ooh, we we lunch, realized that at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I talked a little bit about how the uh, Trump and Biden are kind of mirror images of each other in one way. Of course, they're very, very different, right? And they're they're different in temperament and their rhetoric and their um, their personalities and uh, and but on the issues there there are the issues. There's not a huge amount of difference except on the culture war issues, abortion, guns, um, the border all important issues, but they're not the issues that really have our country on the rocks, right? They're, uh, they're more toward the margins, you know? I, I mean, the border could be existential, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, but um, the, the big issues, the debt, $34 trillion debt, that can sink our country. Uh, I, you know, you know, and I know uh, we're within... 10 years, that debt, within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar that we pay in taxes is going to go to the debt, uh, is going to go to servicing the debt. And within 10 years, it could be 100%. Oh, nobody can figure out how to make that sustainable. That, the, the chronic disease epidemic, which now affects 60% of our population, the biggest cause, $4.3 trillion a year. It's almost five times our military budget. We talked at at lunch about diabetes, diabetes. When I was a kid, and the average pediatrician saw uh, maybe one case of juvenile diabetes during his entire career. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is pre-diabetic or diabetic, and nobody's talking about it. Well, you know, why is this happening? This is, we're now paying more for diabetes than our defense budget. Right. And it's existential. And, you know, that's just one chronic disease. And there's rheumatoid arthritis. There's all these allergic diseases. Autism is in my generation, 70 year old men today, one in 10,000 has autism. And my kids' generation is one in every 34, hmm. one in every 22 boys. Oh, um, and, the, you know, the, the cause of that is, is of, of just handling that one disease is by 2030 or 30 will be a trillion dollars a year. So, and these are unnecessary costs. We should be figuring out what's causing them. And there's no other country in the world that has this. That's existential. I and Trump can't do anything about the debt. They were the ones who caused the debt crisis. It was their style of governance. The two of them together in just four years that were given to each of them together, they drove up about the debt equivalent to what all the presidents in George Washington did. So they can't come in and say, I'm going to solve the debt problem. They can't say I'm going to cause the, solve the chronic disease problem because they, uh, you know, they presided over it. They can't solve the, um, the, the addiction to war. President Trump actually said he was going to end the warfare state. But that's not what he did. Instead, he brought in John Bolton as head of NSA, and and uh, and so, um, and then the other issues, the the polarization of our country, they're both feeding on that. You know, that's how they get elected by polarization. If you want to talk about a, assaults on our democracy, the big danger to our democracy, 
is that we're going to get torn apart by this toxic polarization that has not uh, that is worse today than probably any time since the American Civil War. It's probably worse than when my father ran in 1968, where there was terrible polarization. Do you fear that more than the external threats or even some of these other issues that you're bringing up? I think the, the, the polarization is, I mean, all of them are, are ultimately existential. No, no, you know, particularly the polarization is, is particularly intractable. I don't think it's unsolvable. I think, you know, and you use um, this wonderful phrase during lunch, which is, it doesn't have to be this way. And I, I think all of them look insurmountable, but none of them are. There, there's ways, imaginative and beautiful ways out of all of them. Um, the polarization is particularly acute today because uh, of the social media algorithms mm-hmm. that uh, you know are are uh, are commercially incentivized to um to keep people keep eyeballs on that site as long as possible as it turns out the way that you keep eyeballs on that site is by feeding people confirmation of what they already believe in <laughs> So if you're a Republican and you ask one question, you're going to get a different answer than if you're a Democrat and ask the same question. You're going to give a, uh, you're going to get an answer that reinforces your biases. And that, you know, that drives us all further and further apart. So it's more difficult, but it's solvable. I see this every day, Dave, because, you know, what I said at the beginning of the campaign is I'm going to try, I'm not going to feed into the vitriol or the rancor, the demonization, all this. I'm going to try to identify the common ground, the things that we all share in common, rather than focusing on those little issues that keep us all apart. And what I found is that the, the, the landscapes that are occupied by that common ground are so much bigger. You know, we all think we're so different as Americans, but we actually share the same values. Everybody wants to have great education for our kids. Everybody wants, nobody thinks it's a good idea that this and a low end drug cartel is running America's border policy. Nobody thinks right. that's a good idea, right? right? Everybody wants to make sure our veterans are cared for, that they're not eating in soup kitchens and that PTSD and, you know, these, uh, uh, these brain injuries that, we're taking care of them. Everybody wants to take care of the environment. If you if you want to start a fist fight, talk about climate change. No, yeah. but if you want to um, if you want to find out a place where America, everybody agrees, talk about toxicity in our water and our food, um, in our air. And you know when when we did uh, the protest in Flint, Michigan, against the lead in the water that they had out there. We had Hell's Angels standing shoulder to shoulder with urban blacks. Mm-hmm. Everybody feels the same way. If you want to talk about the Appalachian Mountains, how they're being cut down by mountaintop removal mining, almost everybody is going to agree. Nobody wants to see the acidification of the oceans. Nobody wants to see the, you know, as it rain destroy the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia to northern Quebec. You know, I grew up fishing and hunting in the Adirondack Mountains. It's the oldest protected wilderness in our country. And uh, and yet 20% of the lakes, one out of every five lakes, is, is sterilized. There's nothing in it because wow. of acid rain. Wow. Nobody thinks that's good. Republicans or Democrats, they're all going to say that's a bad outcome. So, And then everybody wants the soils restored in our country, which could solve so many problems. The path out of our debt is in the soils, the path out of climate, you know, whether you believe in it or not. If you believe in it, the best solution is not top-down controls, but rather restoring our soil because that's the biggest carbon sink that there is. So, you know, there are, there are solutions for all of these, and there's ways of talking about these issues that bring us together, but that's not going to come from President Biden or President Trump. There's both of them feed on the polarization. Both of them are saying the, the principal reason you should vote for me is if you vote for the other guy, democracy is going to be over. And that there's no way 
if that's what you're telling the public, that you're going to be capable of ending the polarization. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell. The RFK Jr. campaign merely a stealth plot to throw the election to Donald Trump? Well, mainstream me media figures are extremely concerned this is the case after a Kennedy campaign official made some suggestive comments. These comments were captured in a now viral video that was subsequently pulled down by its owner. RFK Jr.'s New York campaign director, Rita Palma, told a group of Republicans in New York they can help Donald Trump by voting for RFK Jr. if he gets on the ballot. Take a listen. Things, I guess, will change over time because you do have to only pick one candidate at the end of the day. But the Kennedy voter and the Trump voter, the enemy, our mutual enemy is Biden. If the Republicans has accepted the fact that New York, Maryland, Chicago, uh, Illinois, California, New Jersey, Connecticut, most of the Northeast is going to go blue, why wouldn't we put our vote to Bobby? and at least get rid of Biden and get those 28 electoral votes in New York. The card's a little wrong. It says 26 electoral votes. Give those 28 electoral votes to Bobby rather than to Biden, thereby uh, reducing Biden's 270. RFK Jr.'s camp did respond to the video. Armorellis Fox, his campaign director, posted on X that Palma was merely hired as a ballot access consultant and it was not part of her camp of their campaign strategy. She added, quote, the sole aim of which is to win the White House with votes from former Trump and Biden supporters alike. Fox did point to a recent Emerson College poll showing that when RFK Jr. voters are forced to pick between Biden and Trump, most go for Trump, a point the DNC seems to have overlooked in their quest to quash third parties. Speaking of polls, a recent poll from Michigan by USA shows Biden edging out Trump with 45 percent over 41 percent in that state. Okay, so this video sent shockwaves um, all over social media and from the mainstream media, as I said, so, you know, Politico, Rolling Stone, and on and on about, it's like, oh, they're saying the quiet part out loud. This is what we said all along. This is a secret effort to reelect Donald Trump. Uh, no, this is one campaign official speaking to Republicans, trying to convince Republicans to not vote for Donald Trump and instead vote for RFK Jr. Now, she she did go, and we didn't play that part of it. I, I, she, I think she does start to go into, well, right, if, if Biden doesn't get, you know, the, the 270 you need to win, then the election goes to Congress, and then here's how Trump could act, because Congress is not going to vote for RFK Jr., and the, the House delegation, right, leans Republican, and although I think it's the states, right, not, not it gets, starts to get a little dicey, Republican. but, right, that's, so, yeah. so that that could end up, for, for Trump if Biden doesn't get the whole, uh, doesn't get 270. So that that's why, you know, not, that's really why uh, people are concerned, but I just don't, I don't care. Okay. Who I, cares? I, why does it matter? I think this is silly for different reasons that I'm gonna get to in a second, but I do wanna push back a little bit. If she's making a pitch to Republicans to vote for Republicans, that has nothing to do with keeping down, or uh, sorry, Republicans voting for RFK Jr. That doesn't affect Biden getting to 270. If there were already Republicans, I'm gonna vote for Donald Trump anyway. This pitch only works if she's making it to Democrats which is why I think that argument, oh, who's it gonna hurt, she's talking to a room full of Republicans, doesn't actually pass water. I mean, the reason that Democrats are upset is because they're, they're, they believe that RFK Jr. is presenting himself as a Democrat, he was running as a Democrat, he had emblazoned across his website, I'm a Kennedy Democrat, until he left the party. Um, and that they're hoping that uh, independent voters, who might be frustrated with Joe Biden, but might otherwise um, you know, but might bend the knee and vote for him, will instead go ahead and vote for R uh, RFK Jr., actually diminishing his ability to get votes in some of these uh, blue states that she pointed to. That is the argument. Now, the reason why I think ultimately that this is an overreaction from Democrats is a point that you made earlier on, which is that all indications are that RFK Jr. is stealing more votes from 
Republicans than from Democrats. And that has to do with his message. It has to do with his the kind of appeal that he has. And it has to do, frankly, with how much pushback and criticism he's gotten on mainstream liberal channels. So to the extent that RFK Jr. is not in the race come fall, it's going to probably inure to the benefit of Donald Trump. Well, maybe. I mean, some of the polls show that when, when you move it from a two-way race to a three-way race, it seems it, it takes from both the Republican, uh, from the Trump votes and the Biden votes, but it, it, it takes a little bit more from the Biden votes, even though intuitively I agree with you that he is making a pitch more to uh, Republicans and, and he, he, is, he is by far the, the RFK Jr. voters, according to polling, if they can't vote for RFK Jr., say they would rather vote for Trump. But the three-way polls show it eating into Biden a little bit more. Now, it may be different in different states, um, I think it's un look. I think it's unclear. I think he clearly takes from both categories. He takes from people who are not going to vote for either of the candidates anyway, which is very characteristic of third-party efforts and independent efforts. Um, but I just at, like at the end of the day, I don't. How, why is it? Why is it wrong or treated as sinister? Again, especially from the pro-democracy crowd for a for a surrogate or a, you know some low-level person representing the campaign to make a pitch to voters like oh oh no how how you know tactically to get more voters for RFK Jr. Of course that's what they're trying to do. She wasn't even being dishonest about it. She was being transparent. So I, I but, but don't But Robbie, come on. The if they're, I, I, I'm torn here because I, I, I simultaneously don't think it's that much of a cause for outrage, but also there is nothing anomalous about how this workers' remarks are being treated. In any other context, if this were a, uh, a Biden employee who was saying that there was some scheme to um, kind of rig the election against Donald Trump, Donald Trump's entire personality at this point yeah. is the idea that the election has been rigged against him. Or if there were a Republican operative, a Republican a campaign worker that was filmed saying something about how we're going to trick uh, uh, disgruntled black and brown voters by lying to them about X, Y, Z, and but our real goal or just to diminish the Democrats, not actually serve their interests, that would be emblazoned all over the yeah, place. The, so the like, Democratic the Party gives is, money gives money to uh, more, in, in several races in the midterms, gave money, or, or not, not gave money to, but funded ads for the more pro-Trump candidate in districts, in moderate districts, so that that candidate would win the primary, so that they would ultimately win that district. They did that over and over again, and it worked. It worked. Yeah. And so I don't want to hear from I, them that this kind of stuff is underhanded. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think a lot of progressives disagreed with uh, uh, Democrats' choice of repeatedly pie piper candidates in that way. But the, the, the crucial problem that Kennedy has to deal with here is that you have to own your hiring decisions. I mean, the, the buck stops at the top. And it's not that it's the end of the world that this woman was hired, but this is a big faux pas that they're going to have to take a hit for. Because ultimately... This woman was not only hired, she was giving a presentation in front of enough people with enough video cameras for this to have become a viral event. She was not some campaign staffer knocking doors, uh, doors in Des Moines who happened to be caught on their TikTok three years ago some, saying something mm -hmm. unsavory. And so, you know, this is, I think, if, if nothing else, a reflection of some vulnerabilities in how the campaign is being run and how official and stable it is. One point I, I do want to just read some actual stats. This is from The Hill, from a story about a week ago, about the effect that RFK Jr. in fact has on a race, what the race looks like if it's a three-way race versus a two-way race between Biden and Trump. A Harris X Forbes poll taken March 25th found Trump leading Biden in a head-to-head -head matchup by three points, 46% uh, to 43%. With Kennedy, West, and Stein in the race, Kennedy receives 12 points and Trump still leads Biden by three points. Yeah. So, so again, what is not the change? It, yeah. No change. Yeah. Uh, so what's the big brouhaha, really? I mean, I have, I, I, I swear I'm not inventing or making. No, I and have I've seen, seen polls stuff, that showed Biden down. I mean, but I, but I agree seen with stuff you. The other way, for sure. I've yeah, seen, I, I agree with you that the the impact is is not clear, and yeah. he's definitely taking from both sides. And frankly, if and again, if the impact was more decisive one way or the other, it wouldn't change my mind about his candidacy sure. because he has every right to run. Sure. And if you don't like. That people that you know your preferred candidate between Trump and Biden is is, is let, let's say you prefer Biden, but he's going to lose if RFK Jr. is in the race for whatever or the, or the other way around. It doesn't matter. Then that's the system's fault. Like the third party candidates are are the independent candidates are always running against the system, which disadvantages them anyway. So it's so rich to complain about that and then still have this winner take all system and the the public. Funding only kicks in if you get a certain amount of the vote. You can only be in the debates if you. Those are inform. That's an informal rule, but you, you, know, you have to be so important to qualify for that kind of stuff. It's so structurally against the parties. Lack of ranked choice voting, 
yeah. winner take all electoral system. Um, these are problems that absolutely need to be fixed. And then you wouldn't have to, people wouldn't make their, throw their little tantrum about how, oh, you're not voting for the lesser of two evils? How dare you? You yeah, hate but democracy. They, they need the tantrum. They need the ability to lean on that excuse, which is why they're also uh, opposed to ranked choice voting. But that's a really strong point there, Robbie. Stick around. More Rising coming up next. Is this helpful to get your message out, what, whatever you want to get out? I don't know. So I just tell them to try to be a little more thoughtful in that regard. With regards to the campaign, Cheryl, initially, as I understand it, you had limited, if any, interest in getting involved. Uh, w what changed? Um, in a moment of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been interesting and exciting to watch Bobby inspire people. He's bringing people together in a very real way that to me is just extraordinary. I've never seen Republicans and Democrats and independents all together wanting the same thing. I just realized, oh yeah, this is, this is big. And in what ways, if she was up for it, were you interested in really getting Cheryl involved? Everything that she is involved with is good for me. People love her when, you know, when she makes public appearances with me, it makes people happy. And when she does interviews, people love to see her. She has very good strategic judgment. She asks important questions. I mean, one of the examples is uh, when we went to choose the venue where I was gonna make my campaign announcement, Cheryl came with me and we looked at six or seven different places and she knew immediately which place would work. It was one of the most important and significant and consequential moments in the campaign and the appearance is, is largely due to Cheryl's interventions. You've been known for having uh, polarizing views to some or controversial uh, opinions. What was it like for you kind of figuring out because I'm sure you don't agree with everything, um, how to support your husband, but not always endorsing the views? Um, it's a process, you know, you are, you're just sort of living through the moments. He's the smartest person I've ever met in my life, and he really knows what he's talking about. Um, he is an attorney. He, he wants to give you the facts and that's, that's it. And sometimes I will, will have a conversation where it's like people have to be in a space to receive information and to hear it. And are you considering their feelings and thoughts? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> he laughs when I say that because he's like, if it's science, there no, doesn't involve feelings. And you're thinking what in those conversations? No, that's. I think she described it perfectly. <laughs> I'm completely like, you know, the, the way that this lands with people is uh, irrelevant to me if it's truth. I understand you put some rules in place, at least this is according to uh, some of the articles. Uh, you mandated uh, no Steve Bannon show, uh, mm -hmm. no uh, communicating with Alex Jones. What are uh, some of the rules that uh, you've put in place? <laughs> Besides those? Yeah. Listen, I, I, we, we do differ because he will talk to anybody, sit down with anybody, which, uh, you know, is good. Um, but I'm always, you know, I guess if you're running for president, maybe you you think about the big picture. Is this helpful to get your message out, what, whatever you want to get out? I don't know. So I just tell them to try to be a little more thoughtful in that regard. How receptive is he? Uh, he's very receptive. He's going, you know, 100 miles an hour every day, all day. So it's hard because there, everybody wants to talk to him. Everybody wants to 
have them on, have them on their show or sit down and do the podcast, sit down and do the interview. Um, so I, you have to be like, yeah, pause I, for yeah, I wish. Something. Yeah. But I, he doesn't always do that. But when, you know, there's a difference of view, um, what's the process been like for you in figuring out how to navigate that? I have to take a step back. I mean, it, and it's true in life, but especially with Bobby and this um, presidential campaign, like I can't control things. I can't. Um, and does that bother you at, at times that it does. It does. I like to do things in a certain way. I can rely on myself. I know that I can navigate and uh, and work toward an outcome that I'm that I'm that I want. But so with Bobby and what he's going through, there uh, there's no way I can work towards an outcome that I want. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen every day. I don't know what's going to be on the news. I don't know what's going to be on Twitter. There's nothing I can do about it. And even if I sit around all day and hope, oh my God, I hope this thing happens or people see it this way or Bobby says it that way, it doesn't matter. It's not helpful. So I have to keep letting go, letting go. There was a tough moment where you're like, you proposed like publicly separating for like a cool down period. What was the thinking then? And what were the kind of positive was, lessons I learned was, you know, that, from that? I was, it was something I said that yeah. was then misinterpreted by the press and attributed to me. And it was very harmful and hurtful. And it was, it was uh, you know, it was damaging to Cheryl. You know, at that point, I was so heavily censored, I couldn't go on CNN or on the Today Show and say, I didn't say that. <clears throat> and so um, Cheryl was just getting hammered. And I felt an obligation to protect her. And so I made that suggestion to her at the time that we should get a, have a kind of faux separation to make people, uh, to make it stop. And you had to be thinking, so what, the, what the hell like, is this? Well, maybe that's not the best way to go about it. Right. Was a sweet thought. But yeah, not the, not, not the right one. I need polling numbers that actually show that I'm competitive with President Trump and President Biden. And I, you know, I think that that's happening. I'm already, there's a, I think it's a Quinnipiac poll showing me at 27 points in Michigan. So that's within, you mm -hmm. know, all I need to do is take two points from each of them and I, I win and I have seven months to do that, uh, 26 points in Arizona. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's gonna I think it's gonna happen that I'm already beating President Trump and President Biden among young people. So people under forty-five in the battleground states, people under thirty-five nationally. I'm beating them with the in the with the biggest cohort, which is independent voters. In, but this is the first, Dave, this is the first uh, election in United States history or modern history where independents have have outpolled self-identified independents are a larger party than either Republicans or Democrats. Self-identified independents are now 43% of the electorate um, versus 27 who say they're Democrats, 27 who say they're Republicans. And I'm winning in that cohort, which is the biggest. <laughs> So in a weird way, your campaign is sort of, in some respects, fighting human nature to always be worried about everything in a certain respect, but also fighting an algorithmic manipulation at the same time. So how do you peel off the people on both sides? I think that's what most people are wondering. I mean, most of my audience, I think, absolutely could vote for you, but they're going, all right, well, what, how, what does the path look like? What, what is the road to the promised land? Yeah, and I think my challenge is to achieve two things. One is, you know, the the big impediment that people, that the mainstream media and, you know, other media 
um, says about me is that there's no way that I can get on the ballot everywhere. And, you know, we're going to show very quickly that we can get on the ballot everywhere, and we're going to do that very quickly. Much We're going to probably do at least two states over from now on till we get all of, you know, for the next 20 weeks, we're going to do. So two states a week for about 20 weeks. And, then, week, and, and yeah. you believe you'll be on all 50? Yeah, I will be on 50 in 50 states and the District of Columbia. So that, you know, that's just a sort of a, a mechanical impediment that mm-hmm. I have to overcome. And I think that that, you know, for a lot of people, that that's the biggest impediment. And then the other is uh, I need polling numbers that actually show that I'm competitive with President Trump and President Biden. And I, you know, I think that that's happening. I'm already, there's a, I think it's a Quinnipiac poll showing me at 27 points in Michigan. So that's within, mm-hmm. you know, all I need to do is take two points from each of them and I, I win. And I have seven months to do that, uh, 26 points in Arizona. Um so, you know, I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to happen that I'm already beating President Trump, President Biden among young people. So people under 45 in the battleground states, people under 35 nationally. I'm beating them when the, in the, with the biggest cohort, which is independent voters. Independent, this is the first, Dave, this is the first uh, election in United States history or modern history where independents have have outpolled self-identified independents are a larger party than either Republicans or Democrats. Self-identified independents are now 43% of the electorate um, versus 27 who say they're Democrats, 27 who say they're Republicans. And I'm winning in that cohort, which is the biggest. The group that I'm very, that I'm weakest in, which is ironic, is boomers, mm-hmm. which is my generation. And I should be, you would think, right. be strong there because they all remember Camelot and, you know, they're part of the Kennedy era. And I was also, uh, um, when I was known as the leading environmental champion, I was very, very popular with that cohort. Um, but the, my problem with them is that they're getting their news from ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, mm-hmm. MSNBC, and the Washington Post and the New York Times. And though, you know, if, you, if that's your ecosystem, your information ecosystem, you're going to have a low opinion on me. Did, and, did you think you were going to have to fight the machine the way you've had to fight it? Or did you think that just by, by name alone, if not resume, it was going to be a little kinder to you? Uh, no, I knew that I was going to be a fistfight because I have been doing this you know, the vaccine stuff uh, for since 2005, and I know the heat that they can generate. Oh, I knew that it was going to be tough. The, the weird thing is my name, um, although, you know, clearly it's a, it's a, a, a net plus for me, um, but the people with whom I'm most popular are the people who know almost nothing about the Kennedys. They're, hmm. you know, they're Gen, Gen Z they're millennials and they, you know, for them, they they didn't grow up with a picture of my uncle and father over their fireplace. Their parents did, mm-hmm. um, but they didn't. And, and they don't really know anything about the Kennedys. They have a vague knowledge, but, you know, it's all, uh, I think, kind of a jumble for them. And they, they certainly didn't uh, grow up with the kind of, you know, looking at the Kennedys with almost a deity status that a different generation of Americans did. So when I saw you, or last time I interviewed you was about six months ago or five months ago or so in LA, and I said to you that the day you announced, I said on my show that he may not be a Republican at the end of this thing, but he will not be a Democrat. And it was only it was only a couple of months later yeah. that you officially are not a Democrat. So yeah, if, if, you if you're not crazy. surprised, <laughs> well, if you're not, you know, surprised I had a really that, good time yeah. at that at that. Uh, um, yeah, you and I did a like a fireside chat. It was yeah. really really fun, and you know, I said to my staff whenever we go to florida let's try to get on dave's show because uh, uh, it was a very very fun interview for me well because i uh, well i appreciate that but i think also what i think the thing that unites us is a love of country i think we both i think probably describe ourselves as classical liberals and i think that that's what most of the country actually is but it's that polarization that you're talking about with these two guys that is not allowing anyone else it's not allowing people to think there's a way out and I think that that's what we're left with. But so with that in mind, 
you aren't a Democrat anymore, but you are you are what your uncle and what your father represented with the Democrats. So where where do these people fit right now? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I had a I, I had a conversation this week with Aaron Burnett mm-hmm. on CNN, and um, I you know if you took all the things that my father believed in or President Kennedy, my uncle, believed in, I would check every one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm a classic Kennedy Democrat. Um, And, you know, know, I guess you'd call me a classic liberal, the last liberal. And I had this conversation with Erin Burnett, and, um, and I'm very grateful to her for letting me on CNN. I'm sure that she took a lot of flack and she gave me a fair interview. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful. It's the first time in a decade that I've been on that (laughs) um, network and had a live interview that they couldn't, you know, slice and dice. I mean, Jake Tapper said that he will not interview you on his show. He said that you're, you're too, I don't know. I don't remember the exact words, too conspiratorial or, or, Radical or something to that effect. I mean, that just tells you how out of touch they are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's the prevailing attitude there, that that they all tell each other. And it's kind of, I think it's an echo chamber. So, you know, they believe that the propaganda, the descriptions that they've been <laughs> propagating about me over the last 10 years, um, um, and they don't really want their audience to you know, to to see me or hear me because they think I have dangerous thoughts or, you know, I'll put dangerous thoughts into the heads of the audience, which is weird because, it, you know, in the old days, that's what journalism was about. Mm-hmm. It was about, you know, um, it, it was about having conversations and debating issues. And then, you know, if somebody was saying something absurd, letting that either win or die in the marketplace of ideas, you know, and reporters and journalists had enough confidence in their own opinions and their own judgment that they could sit there and make an argument rather than just saying, we're going to silence this person, we're going to cancel this person. But anyway, that's a, a different subject. But one of the, it's related though, because one of the things I said, uh, Aaron said to me, um, you know, she was talking about Trump being a threat to democracy. And I said, and Trump, ironically, had said that very morning that Biden is such a threat to democracy that um, this will probably be the last election if he, if he gets elected. But they say that about each other. Sure. And that's, you know, part of this game that they all, that they're, they're playing. They're, they're trying to pump up fear. They're not Biden has $3 billion that he's going to have, according to the New York Times, for this campaign, more than any, probably double any campaign in history. But he's not going to use that money to amplify his voice. He's going to use it to try to get Trump off the ballot, to try to get me off the ballot, to try to make sure that he doesn't have anybody to run against. And it's ironic because the Democrats are all lambasting Vladimir Putin because he won 88% of the vote because he didn't have any opponents, but that's the situation they're trying to engineer for us with a party picks the candidate and then yeah. nobody else is allowed to run against him. But I said to, um, and she asked me, does, do I really, you know, don't I think Trump is very dangerous for the Republic? And I said to her, I can make an argument mm-hmm. that President Biden is even more dangerous to the Republic. And she had this kind of astonished look where she, you know, her brain stopped working. Yeah. And, um, and I said, you know, the reason for that, that I would say that is because President Biden did something no other president in history. And he'd been, a court has found that. No. A court has no, there's no court that's found that President Trump um, tried to, uh, steal the election or tried to derail the election uh, or tried to um, start an insurrection. There may be plenty of evidence that he did that. There's no court that's found that, Mm -hmm. but there's a courts that have found that president Biden was censoring his opponents Mm -hmm. and not just me, although he did censor me and I did win that suit. So it's not me making it up. Yeah. And by the way, they were censoring me, not because I was, promoting misinformation 
because they have not been able to point to a single post that I made that was factually erroneous and were very, very careful about making sure that everything I put up there, I think I have got the best fact-checking operation in journalism. We have 350 PhD scientists and, and MD physicians who are on an advisory board that look at the stuff we post. And, you know, I, everything I post is, is cited in source to peer-reviewed publications or to government databases. Uh, so they, in, in these conversations that you're watching between the White House censors and their, their, uh, their uh, compatriots at Facebook, um, the Facebook people are saying, well, actually what he's saying is, is factually correct. They had to come up with a new word to describe my post. And the word is mal. It's not misinformation or disinformation. It's malinformation, mm -hmm. which are, is information that is factually correct. But it's nevertheless inconvenient for the government. So they were censoring me. Now, there's, there's, and, but they also were censoring, as you know. I'm on the list. Jim yeah. Gordon released the list. My name was on there. Right. Uh, related many, to the Twitter file. people. Yeah including people who had nothing to do with any kind of criticism of lockdowns or masks mm -hmm. or vaccines or any of that stuff. There are people who are, are criticizing the Ukraine war or, or, you know, the military industrial complex. And those people are now getting um, censored by the, by order of the president. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics, instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell. He was very happy about it and that Cheryl was the best person that he'd ever met. When he talked to Cheryl, he was, uh, that's not what he said. What, what did he say? He said, uh, that's never going to work. <laughs> what do you think you learned about uh, yourself going through your first marriage? That's a good question. I was really surprised at the responsibility that comes with marriage. I don't know why that really took me by surprise. I thought it was going to be the same as being single and dating. Suddenly it's, I don't know, it just gets kicked up a notch. Then you have a baby and you're like, oh, did you pack the baby's suitcase? Like, did I? Well, I thought, I don't know who I thought was going to do it. I did not think it was going to be me. It's just like at every turn, it's like, oh, uh, doctor's appointments and, and I'm sure part of it also is just, you know, being an adult, but I don't know, there's like, the, you're, you're suddenly responsible for other people. And maybe because I was single for so long, I never felt like that. I didn't get married till I was 38, I think. So I don't know why that really surprised me. So Banff Canada, uh, Waterkeeper uh, Alliance fundraiser. If you don't mind, Bobby, uh, set the scene and how the introduction yeah, actually I had, happened. I was, I was close friends with Larry David. And I had uh, lived, me, my family had lived with him and his family for two summers, and then we would go on vacations together. Every year I did a pro celebrity ski event in Banff. And uh, Larry brought Cheryl to one of those. And that was the first time we met. And at the time, the both of us were married. And so there wasn't any sort of instantaneous chemistry, but we, you know, we had a good time with each other. Like the first time I met Bobby at that event, Larry and I had talked and we said, we're not gonna ski. Like, we're just gonna be here for, I don't even know if it was 24 hours, but it was a very fast trip. And that didn't work out too well. No, we get there and the next thing you know, Bobby's got us in skis and he looked at me and goes, we don't even have a, knit cap on. I said, I know, I didn't think we were skiing. And, and then he gave me his, his hat. And I said, now you don't, now you're gonna be cold. And he's like, I'm not worried about it. And six years later, she came back to the same event. And at that point, we were both in the middle of a door system. And, um, and the scales fell off my eyes. And <laughs> I knew that, you know, Larry has all these kind of rules that everybody is supposed to know. And I knew that it would violate one of those rules if I dated his television wife without, uh, without permission. 
And so I went up to the Lowe's Hotel in New York. I met him late at night. It was maybe 10 or 11 o'clock, and I met him in his suite, and I said to him that I was thinking of, uh, of dating Cheryl. And he, I, I was very relieved at his reaction, and he said, he said he was very happy about it and that Cheryl was the best person that he'd ever met. He said that she was beloved in the industry and that she was the only one in Hollywood who didn't have a single enemy. When he talked to Cheryl, he was, uh, that's not what he said. What, what did he say? He said, uh, that's never gonna work. <laughs> oh, that, that'll never work. And serious or joking? No, I Where's think he was it? giving her yeah. like, <laughs> good advice. Just like, uh, yeah, it's not a good, uh, it's not gonna work. Okay, why? What name could you say where he'd be like, that's great, I'm happy for yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think you would. <laughs> I don't know who, yeah. Uh, so I was talking to uh, your close friend, Rachel, and she said uh, you guys were, her words, uh, smitten with each other from day one, still smitten with each other <laughs> today, but that she also like commended you guys for always working on the relationship and prioritizing working on it. Um, how so? I mean, I think that's true. Yeah. I feel so grateful for it, to feel that way about another person. And um, we're as opposite as two people can get. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we share the same values, but in terms of our approach to life and, uh, you know, our everything, the, what we did growing up, our childhoods were just, uh, were utterly different. It's uh, challenging sometimes because we're both in the public eye in a sense, you know? Um, so uh, I think that chatter gets very loud sometimes, people coming at you and saying this and that. So uh, it's been our experience that we have to take a step back not look at social media, don't watch the news, just let's just talk about being husband and wife and boyfriend and girlfriend and having fun. What made you realize Bobby was the one? He's extraordinary in every p possible way. He is such a joyful person, even though I, don't, I didn't expect him to be like that. And especially after all the loss that he's experienced in his life, um, I was just in awe that he still can find happiness and recognize it. Uh, he's very unpredictable. I don't know, he's just, he's everything. You mentioned uh, loss. What do you think going through that taught you guys about the strength of your relationship? Oh man, I think, you know, for me and Bobby, we started in a, a tough place, really, because we, um, because of the loss of, of Bobby's wife. So it just, it felt like, well, if we can be there for each other in really hard times, then the easier times should be really great. <laughs> so, um, and just to know that you have those bonds and and those connections that, once again, you, you look around sometimes in your life and what you're going through and, and you look at the other person, it's like, oh, you and I are the only ones that know how this feels. And we're gonna carry that with us. When we got married, my kids, my kids had uh, been through the death of their mom and they were young and they were all at an age where they would be at risk. And she brought this special love into their lives and a very good judgment, a, a wisdom that she has. How do you propose? Oh my God. I understand it was, it was the, the limited knowledge I have of it is uh, it was a makeshift uh, ring, right? We were, we were in Florida, I was visiting my family, and um, I had my daughter and, and my niece and nephew, two nephews, and we were out at a river, and Jackson, my nephew, uh, Bobby had said something about how much he was in love with me, and Jackson, who was probably 
I don't know how old he was at the time, maybe eight or nine. And he, he was said, uh, oh, well, if you love her so much, why do you marry her? And he's like, okay. <laughs> and then Bobby gets down on one knee and grabs a piece of moss, <laughs> puts it around me, and uh, he says, um, Cheryl, w will you marry me? And I was like, what is happening? And they're like, do it, say yes. And I was like, Bobby, what are you doing? And, um, and I said, yes, I would love to. And had you guys talked about it already no, at that point? Okay. No, really? no, no. I mean, Bobby had, uh, I don't know if he remembers this because you know, Bobby talks about the time that he talked to Larry about dating me. Uh, there was one time, it was, I think it was after that, he called me to tell me about that. And he said, you know, if everything is true that Larry just said about you, I think I'm gonna have to marry you. <laughs> I was like, all right, let's uh, settle down. <laughs> I'm like, well, let's just take it one day at a time. How about now? Who here is from Iowa? You all here to get Bobby on the ballot today? Well, guess what? I'm happy to say that we got more than 500 people here today, and Bobby's gonna be on the ballot in Iowa. Every single one of you is gonna get to vote for Bobby. We're here today because we are tired of these two establishment parties taking big money, running our lives, coming here. You guys get the worst of it. I'm from Virginia, I'm lucky. But you guys, every four years, you get a circus. They come here and they tell you that they support you, they believe in you, they go to the coffee shops, you know? But guess what? Every single time they get right into office, they fund the military industrial complex, they take all the money from us. They make health care costs blow up. They make the cost of housing blow up. Every, nothing changes. Am I right? That's why we're here. Is that why you're here for Bobby? All right. I'm going to introduce our parliamentarian here and our chair, our convention chair. She's heading up Iowa, so she's going to be organizing. So hopefully you all get to know her well. Courtney, handing it over to you. Here is Courtney. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Courtney Hunt, the chairwoman of the We the People Party. We have appointed David Owen as the presiding officer of this convention. Thank you all for coming here today. So first off, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Iowa convention of the We the People Party. My name is Dave Owen, and I'm the presiding officer today. I'm going to officially gavel in this convention, but we also want to make sure that people understand for those joining us at Zoom and our other satellite conventions that are being hosted independently, they will be a part of this process. So we're officially gaveled in. So first minor technical thing, in order to vote in today's convention, you must be wearing a wristband indicating that you signed in as a participant in attendance at today's convention for this location. Um, if you do not have a wristband, please return to the credentialing area. And um, when instructed to vote, you will raise your hand displaying the wristband to indicate how you're voting, and I will call that as needed. If you're voting yay, you will raise it. I'll then call for nays. They will then raise it. We have one order of business today. Um, but first, we want to open with the Pledge of Allegiance, so everyone is able, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, brief explanation of how this works. We are gonna open the floor for nominations for one office at a time, with the exception of the electors, who will be nominated as a slate. 
This is because electors had to be pre-selected eligibility and had to file the forms in order to be eligible. They have already pre-filed those forms and are running uncontested. We will take nominations in the following order. President of the United States, Vice President of the United States, and then the presidential electors. I'm now going to open the floor for nomination for the office of President of the United States of America. Do I have a motion to nominate? I hear multiple people motioning to nominate RFK Jr. I'm gonna take that as also having a second. Can we please verbally say that we second? All righty. All in favor of the nomination of RFK Jr. for the We the People Party, on the count of three, please raise your hand in the air with the wristband to designate aye. 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 All, op all opposed, now please raise your hand to indicate a nay vote. Seeing none, I declare that RFK Jr. has the nomination for the office of President of the United States. The next office open for nomination is for Vice President of the United States. Do we have a motion? Who do we motion? I am hearing Nicole Shanahan, and I think I have a second, but I'm not sure. Do I have one? Yeah. Sounds like I do. Okay, so we're going to repeat the process. For all of those in favor of nominating Nicole Shanahan for the office of the Vice President of the United States, raise your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. I have to ask for the opposed. All opposed. All right, the, ne the yeas have it. Nicole is officially the nominee for the Vice President of the United States. As previously mentioned, the electors were pre did not, there was only a certain group that filed their paperwork. We have the exact number of electors who have filed their paperwork. So we are gonna nominate them by what's called unanimous consent. So everyone just needs to raise their hand in approval of our elector slate for We the People Party. All in favor? Aye. Are there any opposed? The ayes have it. Now, I'm sure that you would all love to hear from our new nominated candidate for President of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., as such, I'm going to welcome him to the stage and let him take over, and they're going to play a brief package to introduce him. We're going to wait a minute on that, but he'll be up shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, real quick, uh, while Mr. Kennedy gets ready to come out and thank all of you and celebrate here with you, we have a couple of quick videos we'd like to play and then he's going to come out. Over the last five years, our country has become something unrecognizable. Journalists have exposed a massive censorship complex. Federal agencies like the FBI, the IRS, the Justice Department, and even the Secret Service have been weaponized against political opponents. We're subject to constant surveillance. The government wraps itself in lies and secrets. Corruption is pervasive within the regulatory agency and the halls of power. There's only one thing that can turn this all around, 
And if you thought I was going to say that it's me, you were mistaken. That's not something that I can do alone. But if enough people want to reclaim our country, I can be your instrument. I'll be the sledgehammer that the American people will wield to smash apart the corrupt merger of the state and corporate power. But I can only do that with your active support before and after I enter the White House. And I promise you that I'm going to redeem the trust that you put in me. And together we'll show that we the people can take back our power. This is a day of affirmation, a celebration of liberty. We stand here in the name of freedom. We are committed to peaceful and nonviolent change. We must recognize the full human equality of all of our people, not just to those of a particular religion, not just to those of a particular race, not just to the wealthy, but to all of the people. We must do it for the single and fundamental reason that it is the right thing to do. A new twist this morning for the country's most famous political dynasty. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the presidential race. October 9th, in the state. That it's time to heal a divided nation and return the power to the people. Robert Kennedy Jr. We are told today that our nation is hopelessly divided, but I found something different as I travel this country. I have witnessed an upwelling of optimism that I've never seen before. Something is stirring in us that says it doesn't have to be this way. And so I've come here today to declare our independence from the tyranny of corruption, which robs us of affordable lives, our belief in the future, and our respect for each other. But to do that, I must first declare my own independence. Independence from the Democratic Party. And from all other political parties. I haven't made this decision lightly. It's very painful for me to let go of the party of my uncles, my father, my grandfather and both of my great-grandfathers, but my sacrifice is nothing compared to the risk our founding fathers took when they signed the Declaration of Independence 247 years ago. They knew that if their revolution failed, every last one of them would be hanged. They chose to place everything on the line. When John Adams put his pen down after adding his signature to the Declaration, he turned to those present, and he said to them, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, from this day on, I am with my country. I'm going to make that same pledge to you today so that I can stand before you, as every leader should stand before you, free of partisan allegiance, free from the backroom deals, a servant only to my conscience to my creator and to you. Every president enters office promising to unite the nation and to work with people from the other party across the aisle. None of them ever does it. They can't. They're already chosen a side. Well, I'm not going to have that problem. I'm going to build coalitions from both sides of the aisle. And except for the small minority of public officials who are actually corrupt, I'm going to tell you this secret. They, too, want liberation from the system that has captured them. And isn't that ultimately what we all want? Liberation from a system that robs us of our wealth, our health, our hope, our patriotism, our ideals, our freedoms, and ultimately our sense of ourselves as a good and capable people. 
Is healing our divided nation possible? Let's go take back our country. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the next president of the United States, Mr. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Thank you, Iowa. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for getting us on the ballot here in Iowa. Now, I just, I just had an interview with ABC National News back here. <laughs> and they said, and they asked me about a poll that came out this morning by the New York Times that said that I only have 2% support of people in this country. Uh, do you think if I only had 2% report that this big a crowd would come in here today? Uh, oh, I saw this poll this morning and I called our pollster and I said, how did they do this? Because the last time at the New York Times did a poll, I got 24%. And I got, and this was in November, and I got, I won, I beat President Trump and President Biden and everybody under 45 years old. And I beat Trump, President Trump and President Biden in all independence, which is the biggest political party now in our country. This is, the first, this is the first presidential race in history where self-identified independents are the biggest political party. 43% of the vote are, call themselves independents. First is only 27% 27 Demo 27 for Democrats and 27% Republicans had a dramatic change. Oh, I said, how did I drop? Do you think that I've dropped 22 points in popularity since last November? No. Oh. Oh, I, I'm going to tell you how they did it. If you look in the cross tabs for the vote, it says it has President Trump's name, President Biden's name, and then it says RFK. But behind it, there's a parenthesis that says VOL. What does that mean? Here's what it means it means voice out loud. What does that indicate? Here's what it means. When they called the people up, this is a telephone poll. So when they call the people up, they say to them, do you prefer President Trump or President Biden? That's all. My name's not on that. Cornell West isn't on it. Jill Stein isn't on it. This is very different than the poll they took in November, where my name, where it was a three-man race between me, President Trump, and President Biden. Now it's just a two-man race, according to the New York Times. But a certain percentage of the people who they called protested and said, wait a minute, I want Robert Kennedy. So that's the people that they counted. And that's why it's only 2%. That's like if they called up people and said, do you prefer the color blue or the color red? Most people would choose from those categories, yeah. And if you, a certain number of people are gonna say, wait a minute, I like green. It's not gonna be all the people who actually would prefer green. It's just the people who say, wait a minute, why aren't you giving me a choice? So that's how they do it. And they, you know, I'm gonna leave it to you to speculate about why the New York Times would wanna diminish 
the apparent popularity that I am now enjoying in this country that all the other polls say are increasing day by day. Why, you know, why do they want to do that? Well, two weeks ago, the New York Times reported that President Biden is going to have $3 billion to win this election. It's more than double what any campaign has spent in the past. It's the most that anybody's ever had. It's going to be the most expensive political campaign in history. And President Biden is not going to use that money to amplify his voice or to tell the American public why we should vote for him based upon the issues. He's going to use the great bulk of that money to make sure that his opponents cannot compete in this election. I, and, you know, he's done that to President Trump, which I'm no fan of, of Donald Trump's. And I don't want to beat him because the system is rigged. Because all that's going to do... I want to lead this nation. I want to inspire this nation. I don't want to make them feel aggrieved. I don't want to make them feel like they've been ripped off, that they've been tricked. And I want them to feel like they got to vote for who they wanted to vote for. I want to beat President Trump on a level playing field. The, the, the Democratic Party is not just going after President Trump. They're going after me, they're going after Cornel West, they're going after Jill Stein to make sure that you cannot vote for the candidate that you want to vote for. That's not democratic. <laughs> Last Monday, you know, they've been suing us in all these states, so even when we get enough signatures, they're trying to keep us off the ballot. And we've been winning. We have a, a young lawyer who has been terrific, who, who works out of his own law firm, and he's working at a fraction of the price that a lot of other lawyers would pay, but he's brilliant, and he's won every one of these cases, case after case after case. So on Monday, the DNC's law firm called our attorney and said, we want you to, to give you a million dollars a year to come work for us. And, <laughs> and we're going to give you Supreme Court cases and we're going to make you famous. And that's what they said, we're going to make you a superstar. So, and he said no. So well, if you ask the Democratic Party, the, you know, the big wigs at the Democratic Party, why are they doing these things? They say, well, we have to do these things. We have to do this kind of, we've hired this team to do these kind of underhanded tricks to keep Kennedy RFK off the ballot. But we have to do that because if President Trump gets elected, it's going to destroy democracy. So... And, you know, the RNC is the same, the same thing, by the way, that if President Biden gets elected, it's going to destroy democracy. But from, from my legacy party, the Democratic Party, to make the argument that we have to destroy democracy in order to save it is a big disappointment. But all of us have seen that, haven't we? We've seen the Democratic, both the Democratic and the Republican Party turn against the values that they traditionally represented for our country. And so many of us feel homeless today in terms of political parties because we still love our country and we believe in its idealism. And, uh oh, What they're telling us is that the Democrats are telling us you have to be scared of if President Trump gets elected. The Republicans are trying to tell us you have to be terrified if President Biden gets elected because it's going to be the end of the Republic. And but if you look at and if you look at these two candidates, they're both very different in terms of their temperament, their personalities, their dispositions. 
their relationships with people and the way they present themselves. But on the issues that actually separate them, it's, they're very, very narrow. The issues of abortion, uh, the issues of gun control, the issues of, of, uh, of transgender rights, and maybe a few other issues, they're all, you know, and the border, important issue, and all of these are important in their own way, very important, but they're all the culture war issues, and none of them are actually the issues that are existential for our country, the issues that are important if we want to see the survival of our country and if we want to see prosperity for our children, if we want to see the moral authority of our nation restored, if we want to see meaning in the lives of Americans and us proud again that we're an exemplary nation and our survival as a country, neither of them, for example, has any solution. None of them are even talking about what to do with our $34 trillion deficit. And they can't complain about it. They can't solve it because they're the ones who created it. President, <laughs> President Trump, when he was elected for his four years, ran up an $8 trillion deficit. It was more, he spent more money that we didn't have and all the presidents combined for 283 years, going all the way back to George Washington, more than all of them put together. Then President Biden came in and he did the exact same thing. So neither of them can credibly tell us, I'm gonna solve the deficit problem. And this is a existential crisis for our country. We are already spending more every year to pay the interest in that debt than our entire military budget. With exactly what the, exactly what, five years from now, 50 cents in every dollar that they, that the government collects in taxes is gonna go to servicing the debt. Within 10 years, 100% of the taxes that the government collects will go to paying the debt. Does anybody here think that that's sustainable? Is that an issue that you want left to your children? No. Don't we need to solve this issue? Yes. Don't you think that this country deserves a president who is thinking about this issue and thinking of ways to solve it? Yes. What, about, what about the chronic disease epidemic? Is the big, that's even a bigger problem. Because we're now spending, when my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60%. We spent, when my uncle was president, about 4% of GDP on healthcare costs. Today, it's around 20% and climbing. The biggest cost is chronic disease. $4.3 trillion a year that we're spending on, on chronic disease. And who's making money from that? Oh. The pharmaceutical companies. And, and who owns all those pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, BlackRock. Oh, and, and those pharmaceutical companies are causing it with you know, some of the bad medicines they give us, and then they're reaping the harvest of all that chronic disease. But also, the processed food companies. The processed food companies, which bought up the tobacco companies, you know, Kraft became, went to work for Philip, went, became a subsidiary of, of Philip Morris, et cetera. And they brought 10,000 scientists, many of them from the tobacco industry, to make processed foods addictive and to make them so that they don't fill you. And we now have a thousand ingredients in our processed foods in this country that are illegal in Europe. Is it any wonder that we have a chronic disease epidemic in this country? And who owns all of those processed food companies? BlackRock. And who is one of the biggest donors to both the Republican and Democratic Party? Right? So they're not allowed to solve that problem. 
They're not because there are people making money on that problem who are giving them money. And that's one of the reasons they needed to get me out of the Democratic Party. That's one of the reasons they needed to get Bernie Sanders out of the Democratic Party. Oh, and this is, you know, we're now spending more on diabetes than we do on our entire military budget. When I was a kid, when my uncle was president, a typical pediatrician saw one diabetes case in his entire lifetime. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door has diabetes. And, uh, and, there's, and nobody's talking about this. President Trump and President Biden aren't talking about it. They're not gonna solve it. They have no way to. They presided over this dramatic increase in it. You will never hear them even discuss it. And yet it's the most important issue in our country because if we don't solve this problem, our budget is gonna be out of control and our kids are all gonna be sick. And you know, if we have... Listen, we are a resilient nation. We are resilient. We have terrible problems in this country right now. We have bad food problems. We have bad health problems. We have economic problems. But we also have the capacity to solve those problems. We have the economic problems are, are disastrous, but we have the greatest entrepreneurs in this country of any nation in the world. Our, our farms are getting destroyed from soil de uh, depletion and from chemicals and, and uh, you know, from chemical fertilizers and from nitrogen and, and, and phosphorus or chemical pesticides and herbicides, nitrogen, carbon-based uh, fertilizers. But we also have the best regenerative farming and healthy soil farmers in this country you know we're breaking ground on that and and the best people in the world who are doing the most interesting things and i talk to them every week on my podcast these extraordinary farmers who are learning ways and developing ways and reinstating ways of preserving the soil of ending the dependence on chemicals and fertilizers and we need don't you want a president who's thinking about that and who's trying to help those farmers transition and we have a we have a we have a terrible health crisis in this country but we also have the best integrative medicine doctors the best functional medicine doctors of any country in the world Oh, you know, if you're, if, if we're, our country's gonna face crises over the next eight or a decade, and they could be terrible crises. We could see the, the end of, of the dollar as the, as the global reserve currency. We could see wars. We can see, we can see more pandemics. We can see all of these, uh, you know, we have the resilience in our country and the toughness that we can solve any of these problems. But if you're sick, if you suffer chronic disease, it sucks the energy and the heart and soul out of you and your family. And it's the one thing we need to make sure no matter what we fumble, no matter what mistakes we make, we've got to make sure that our children are healthy. And, and neither neither of these presidents is even thinking about those things. They're not going to solve them. Neither of these presidents is capable of ending the polarization, which is also toxic and existential in our country. We don't know, we don't know how it's going to end. Because not only are we being, being, being corralled and pumped to hate each other by our political leaders, by the corporations who are strip mining us, treating us, commodifying our children, our landscapes, our people, our health. Not only that, but we now have these social media, rhythms, social media algorithms that amplify the hatred and the polarization. And it's, only, it's impossible for a social scientist or any of anybody to tell us how this is gonna have a good ending unless we take responsibility today 
for ending that polarization. And, and that's, what this, that's what this campaign is about. And President Trump and President Biden have no capacity to do that. They are the products of that anger, that hatred, that acrimony, the, the vilification, the demonization. Those are the tools that they're using to get elected, the fear mongering. You know, that guy's gonna destroy the public. No, that guy's gonna destroy the public. And the people who follow them are deplorable or they're, you know, they're elites or whatever. We have to start thinking about that, thinking that way. We need to start looking at each other and seeing Americans who are concerned, who love our country, and we need to give them the capacity to love our country without hating each other. And President Biden and President Trump are not gonna be able to do that because they are the products of this system. They are the ones who are, who are fortifying and amplifying this system of vilification and demonization against each other and their followers. Do you think that President Biden and President Trump that either of them have either any interest or capacity to restore the, the ability of the government to start telling the truth to the American people? No, I don't think so either, because they're part of this system where they deny that the government's even lying to us. And you know, I, you know, I grew up at a time when it was, most Americans could not conceive that the government of the United States would lie to them. The first hint that we had was when I was a little boy, and in 1959, Gary Francis Powers, the pilot, was shot down in a U-2 over Russia. And he had a, a kid where he was supposed to give himself cyanide and kill himself so that he could never be interrogated or used as an example or displayed. And Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, which was running the YouTube program, which was top secret, told President Eisenhower the pilot is dead, the plane is in a million pieces, they'll never be able to prove it, so deny that we even have this program. Khrushchev, who, Khrushchev and, and Eisenhower are about to meet for a summit to end the Cold War in Vienna. And, and, uh, and Dulles got Eisenhower to lie to the Americans and to the rest of the world and say, we don't have, know what you're talking about. There is no YouTube program. And then the Russians produced Gary Francis Power alive. And, and people in our country looked at each other for the first time and said, oh my God, the government lies to us. It told us a lie. But most people, when my uncle was president, 80% of Americans still believe that the government of the United States always told the truth. And in 1973, the Pentagon Papers came out. The first time we had a history of 20 years of lies that hundreds of government officials had told the American people. And we started thinking it's still unusual but about certain things, they do lie to us. Today, I don't know if, if, there, if there's anybody left in this country who believes that the government does not lie to you, then you're not paying attention. Because <laughs> and during COVID, we saw how the, the media, which at least used to call the government on its lies, that they've become the bullhorn for government propaganda and lies. And that they see their job not as informing the public and exposing those lies and maintaining a constant fierce posture of skepticism toward the federal government and for other centers of authority, which is what traditionally the press is supposed to do, they now see their job as reinforcing government propaganda and government lies and corporate propaganda. And so all of us, there is no check anymore. And do you think President Trump or President Biden has the inclination, the concern, the capacity to change that system? I can tell you this. Now, when I become president, 
the government, the government. The government is going to stop lying to the American people. And, and I'm going to issue an executive order my first day in office saying that any government official who lies is going to lose their job. And I'm going to give a speech to the, to the, uh, to the, at, the at the National Press Club re-educating the American media about what his job is in this country, in a democracy, which is not to believe people, not, don't even believe me. You shouldn't. We want a democracy in this country, and the job of the press and the democracy is to constantly question, to constantly disbelieve, to examine and parse through every statement by every public official to see whether they're telling their lies. Their job is not to manipulate the public. Yeah. Their job is not to silence doctors and scientists and, and mothers of injured children <laughs> who, are try, who have a right to tell their story to the public. That's not their job. Their job is to tell the truth, to question everything, to examine everything, and that is the America that I'm going to lead us back to. And, and do you think President Trump or President Biden has the capacity or the inclination to end the forever wars? No. Oh. President Biden clearly does not. <laughs> President Trump said that that's what he's going to do. But then he brought John Bolton in to run the NSA. And we heard today that he's promised the Secretary of Defense, I don't know that this is true, but I've heard this from his people in his campaign, that he's promised the Secretary of Defense spot to Mike Pompeo. Oh, these are the neocons who are gonna to continue to run our government and continue to, uh, to embroil us in these destructive wars that are robbing us, of robbing our children of their future and are running up the debt that are making us less safe everywhere in the world, every place. And we have engaged in a war over the past 30 years is worse off today than when we went in there. Every place. We, and everybody knows it in the world. Everybody knows that we have misused our military power. We squandered it on bad wars that we shouldn't have gotten involved in. And I'm going to end that forever. Oh, if you want, if you, we know what President Trump and President Biden are going to do if they win this election. They're, they're going to do exactly what they did before. We've already seen it. We know what the future is if we do that. We know they have no capacity to change that. So if you want more of the same, you should vote for them. Does anybody here want more of the same? No. I didn't think so. Does anybody here want a complete change? Yeah. Well, if you want that change, you got to vote for me because I'm the only one that is capable of doing it. And, uh, oh, uh, I, want to, I want to thank everyone here for coming out today, your energy and your enthusiasm and the hard work that so many of you came from all over this state, from over 25 counties, to come here today. And it inspires me, it hardens me, it keeps me going. I said one year ago today, I think it was, when I announced my campaign, that I was, uh, was going to do everything that I could in this country to 
restore our country to the values that we all, can, we all associate with America. The ones that we want, the, the ideals that we want America to represent to the rest of the world, the moral authority of the rest of the world. I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna give you back your country. I said back then, if you give me a sword and some ground to stand on, that I will give you your country back. I need... Hello. Thank you. You are you are my friends, you are my family. You are I'm so grateful that all of you are on this journey of, with me. It's a journey to it's an idealistic journey to restore everything that we want our country to represent to our children and the rest of the world. Thank you all very very much and thanks for getting me on the pile ballot here in Iowa. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your official nominee for We the People Party, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. So there are two more things we have to do to wrap up this convention. First, I gotta read something that's a little bit boring. We have 686 credentialed delegates representing more than 35 counties in Iowa. Now, I need a motion from the floor from someone so that we can leave here. That's called a motion to adjourn. I hear a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? And so now, once again, we're gonna raise our hands in the air. We're gonna shout Bobby. And then we're going to adjourn. So all in favor of adjourning? Aye. The yeas have it. I do, what? Do I do uh, the selfie line? Yeah, I, I don't know about the selfie line. Okay, thank you all. And with that, we are officially adjourned. Thank you, thank you everyone so much. As you all hopefully know by now, Mr. Kennedy loves to meet every one of his supporters and he always likes